I've come to London to meet Max Wilson, archivist for the Lloyd's Register Foundation, to find out about the Mauritania for our Iconic Ships series. Max, let's start by talking about this amazing building we're in. Where are we? What's going on? Uh, so you're in our, basically our temporary archive store um, while we're in the middle of our office refurbishment and uh, this is the Cannon House. It uh, originally would have been an artillery uh, factory providing um, armaments to the army and the navy uh, from about the 1850s onwards. But now it's just full of your wonderful old, yeah. old registers and material. <laughs> yep, now it's just yeah archives and, uh, and library materials and yeah, interesting. Good stuff. Well, I got in touch because we're doing this series of iconic ships and then I said, I bet you've got some good iconic ships, records of iconic ships in the Lloyd's Register archives, and you certainly do. Um, and, but one of them you pulled out and you said, I know what, let's talk about the Mauritania. So what was it that, about the Mauritania that made you think, oh, I know what, let's do this one? Um, well, she's, she's just a British icon, really. She's just uh, an, amazing, an amazing example of luxury, the height of uh, luxury travel, um, you know, at uh, you know a really pivotal time in history. She's that she kind of dominated, um, you know, for a very, very, admittedly a very brief period. She was the world's largest ship, the world's largest moving structure. Um, she uh, held the very fastest record, the fastest average speeds crossing the Atlantic for about twenty years, longer 20 than twenty years. Yeah, so it's um, you know, and she was just yeah, as I say, just really she came to define um, luxury. Really, Franklin D uh, Delano Roosevelt. Uh, when she was eventually broken up, um, sent a letter of protest. Uh, <laughs> and he famously hated uh, sea travel. Really? Um, and he absolutely fell in love with Mauritania. Wow. What was it about the ship then? Why, why was it so, was it just so unusually, <laughs> unusually lovely? Yeah, he, well, I mean, as I say, he, he hated uh, sea travel and he, he described her as having a soul you could talk to, oh. uh, which is uh, interesting. Um, but uh, she, she, was a very, a very opulent ship, uh, opulent on, I think, a, a completely different scale to all of her predecessors. Um, you know, we know things like uh, the state rooms in the very first class, um, uh, you know, in the first class areas, they were made with things like, uh, I think it was 28 different types of exotic wood, uh, wow. for example, were used. Um, you know, and she had things like, uh, you know, a, a sort of an, an open veranda cafe that was modelled on the Orangery in Hampton Court Palace and... Um, you know, other lots and lots of interesting things like that, and Turkish baths and swimming pools and other kinds of interesting. What's interesting happened to pieces. the times we live in? Can you name twenty-eight different types <laughs> of exotic wood? I can't, no, but not yeah, not personally. Mahogany, <laughs> mahogany, oak, <laughs> uh, elm. Yeah. I'm not sure. I thought you should. Someone should do some research and find out what those twenty-eight different types of uh, exotic wood were on the Mauritania. Um, it's really interesting, isn't it? Where you get to a period in the development of ships and shipping where extreme attention to detail and luxury almost seems taken for granted, certainly by the mm. time they're building Titanic and Olympic. But it, I think it really was with the Mauritania. They, they, it, it all, from Brunel onwards, it suddenly kind of, it settled in the Mauritania. And um, what's fantastic about the Lloyd's Register archives is you've got loads of um, written material relating to the Mauritania. So what did you manage to find? Well, uh, I, mean, I suppose, yeah, the very first document um, that really leapt out at me um, does cause a bit of a problem for the interview. Oh, is it? Um, it does slightly, yeah. Uh, so really, uh, in, in actuality, I shouldn't really be showing you any records from Mauritania. Um, we have a memo from uh, 1904 uh, during the very kind of early design phases of Mauritania and Lusitania from our chief, Harry John Cornish, basically instructing all Lloyd's Register surveyors and clerical staff not to divulge any details uh, on any... Uh, you know, in any circumstances of Mauritania's construction. Wow. Um, so, yeah. It was top secret. Yes, yeah. They, um, the Cunard line, um, you know, that had commissioned Mauritania and Lusitania were, they, they had a real bee in their bonnet about, um, you know, trying to protect these designs from industrial espionage. I suppose really to try and maximise the impact that they would have when they finally took to the seas. Um, yeah. They didn't want anything to you know, to get out to the media or the press. It sounds like a balance between concern of other people stealing their ideas, but also wanting it to be uh, like what we'd see as a press release now, where everything can be shut down. No one wants to tell anyone about the details of what's yeah, coming. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a huge amount of money. Um, I mean, Mauritania and Lusitania were built um, pretty much with government funding. Um, How did so, that work? So it was, it was 
really, I suppose, uh, the, the British government loaned the Cunard line, uh, the, well, £2.6 2 million in the very early start of uh, the 20th century. Uh, so that would be about 200 to £250 million in today's money. Wow. And they gave it a very, very low interest rate of about 2.57%. Um, uh, and uh, the idea was that you know, she would have to pay this over 20 years. So really she got a very good deal and the British government were very invested in making sure that Mauritania was built. Um, in part really to try and uh, really sort of secure the Cunard line and also secure this uh, idea of British engineering as being the best in the world. Mm. Uh, there was only one caveat um, to the loan and that was that uh, she had to be able to uh, to offer her services in the event of a war ah. as an armed merchant cruiser. So what year are we talking about here? This was in uh, about 1903. Right. Um, so interesting that they were already putting themselves um, on, well, Britain was already starting to put itself on a war footing at this stage. And some of that's already visible within her design as well. Really? Like what? Um, so boilers, for example, um, she, she had a slight break with other liners um, and she, her boilers were in the very middle of the ship um, with two very long 350 foot uh, coal bunkers either side. Uh, and apparently, supposedly, this was a deliberate decision in order to protect the boilers and the furnaces from uh, the worst effects of artillery fire in the event that she got caught up in a in a in a in a sort of a, a, a skirmish or, or a flurry of activity on the on the sea. It's fascinating this idea that the government are, are anticipating a war, isn't it? And and are so mm. conscious of of the the pressure that's going to come on merchant shipping. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And as I say, you know, the, these, these designs start to reflect that. And it, it's very interesting that that particular caveat was put in with, with regard to her loan. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, luckily she, never, she was never used as an armed merchant cruiser, ironically, because uh, at the outbreak of the war, uh, she very quickly made a dash for Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, and, uh, you know, where she was awaiting instructions from the British government to be converted uh, and they actually turned around and said no she's far too big and her right. fuel consumption is far too large so you know she they actually then said you can go back to to civilian service and okay. she very briefly did but of course very few people were willing to travel across the Atlantic during the First World War and so she spent the next nine months um, you know sort of essentially in dock uh, in Liverpool uh, and then she really then started to be used as things like uh, troop ships to the Dardanelles for the Gallipoli campaign and um, and then as a hospital ship later on, and then later as a troop ship again. Uh, I wonder who got the first class cabins on the exactly, way to the Dardanelles <laughs> for the last ever trip. Yeah. yeah, you know, in terms of records, have you got certificates and is, uh, entries in the register book for her? Yes, yeah, so we have uh, 341 records for specific archive documents for Mauritania. Wow. Um, that's just Mauritania. We also obviously classed the Lusitania as well, uh, who's nearly identical um, uh, to Mauritania. Uh, I think Mauritania is five feet longer, um, and uh, but yeah, in terms of in terms of what we have for Mauritania, yeah, it's it's reports of survey, including her first entry report, which is kind of I suppose her sort of birth certificate, right. the very first time she formally enters uh, our records. Um, we have all of the kind of um, uh, correspondence that goes back and forth between Lloyd's Register and the you know the committee that's that's deliberating on all of the designs. It's a wonderful that moment where someone would have written a kind of Mauritania for the very first time yeah. on an official document. Yeah. And it's, Clark, it, you know, it is it, alive. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's really interesting. You know, and of course, there's lots of back and forth about certain designs and things like that, and the machinery. The machinery it, itself was very. Um, you know, cutting edge, and I think there was there was a lot of back and forth about whether or not it was possible in such a large ship. And um, yeah, so yeah. In addition to that, yeah, it's lots of certificates, as you say, and obviously we have our register of ships, which includes lots of references to Mauritania each year throughout her life until she's finally broken up in 1935. And what does it say about the ship? Is it simple information? If you've ever seen any of the survey reports that we have, they have all of the information related to a ship's kind of uh, ownership and build right at the very top, almost as, you know, and it's this information which goes into the register book entry. So it's everything to do with uh, the name, the ship's master uh, or the captain, um, the, the tonnage, the, the length, um, you know, obviously the classification within the middle uh, that she receives, uh, as well as where she's built, who built her, who built the engines, what kind of engines she's got. So actually, really, in what is about probably maybe half an inch worth of printing space, 
um, that information is all there just on the line in the register book. Um, mm. So you can find everything you need. And what about technical drawings? I mean, these are all the things that we need to be able to work out whether Mauritania is really deserving of, of the name Iconic. Well, technical drawings, yeah. So we, so we have a lot of different types of technical drawings and plans. Um, you know, things like boiler plans, engine plans, shafting plans, pumping arrangements, things like that. Um, but I think in terms of her machinery itself, I think um, you know, her boilers, I mentioned before, they're incredibly, uh, you know, they're really interesting. Um, and uh, interesting, we have a record within the archive, uh, which is a celebration, um, really, of us, of uh, the, the Jubilee of the Walls End Slipway and Engineering Company, which was the company which secured all of the contracts to, to, to create um, uh, Mauritania's machinery and engines and boilers. And one of the things that they boast about is the fact that they actually, their boiler making department, which was a huge warehouse building in Newcastle, uh, it basically had to completely well, it needs to be extended just for Mauritania's boilers. Uh, and they had to fit new types of you know, hydraulic uh, winching gear and cranes um, with you know, lifting capacities of up to about 100 tonnes. Yeah. Um, so they're really huge, huge boilers, you know, nothing like it before. It's, what, it's, it's a theme that happens again and again in the history of shipbuilding, where someone says, oh, well, let's build a bigger ship. And then all the people who have to do it go, well, we can't. We, yeah. we don't have, our cranes are not big enough, <laughs> our warehouse is not big enough, our slipways are not big enough. We can't do it. Yeah. So they have to kind of go back three or four stages. So, um, you know, she's changing the whole nature of shipbuilding mm. um, in, in her own presence, isn't she? Ab absolutely. Uh, it's, um, you know, and I think one of the, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's fair to say that the Cunard line had a huge... Uh, vendetta really to, to try and you know, really put Mauritania on the very top in terms of being the largest ship in the world but also being the fastest um, you know they'd uh, you know it really sort of stuck in their craw that um, you know that uh, uh, Norddeutsche Lloyd another rival German shipping line um, their ship Kaiser Wilhelm de Gross uh, was launched in uh, 1897 and then in 1898 she took the Blue Ribbon to the fastest Atlantic crossing record <laughs> from Cunard's mm. uh, Lucania. Uh, and yeah, this is, so this is something that they, they, I think they were, they were particularly eager to try and get back. And they, as a result of this, this is what pushed them to, uh, to exploring the idea of uh, sort of direct action steam turbine machinery. And Mauritania is the very first transatlantic express liner to use this type of technology. Ah, I like the idea of this British the German imperial <laughs> competition before mm. the war as experienced in a battle between, mm. between liners. And then how, how quickly was it before people realised just how quick Mauritania was going to be? Well, I think it's, um, it, it's very interesting. They kept their speed trials very, very secret as well. Um, so Lloyd's Register was, was there present at the, the speed trials. Um, and interestingly, they, they refused to, uh, you know, to send back any information by wire. And so they, the, the times that they documented on board uh, were sent back and forth by a carrier pigeon. Really? Um, yeah, because they, they, they could not afford for it to be intercepted uh, by anybody else. And so really, I think it was, it was actually very, very quickly that this, this, this steam turbine technology was, was seen to be something that was, that was actually going to change shipping forever. Um, you know, this, was, this was a process that had been uh, designed by Charles Algin and Parsons. Um, and demonstrated at the Spithead Naval Review in 1897, where his little private yacht, Turbinia, um, was basically zigzagging around uh, all of the largest uh, and fastest ships of the Royal Navy and completely outran them. Um, so Mauritania, uh, and interestingly, Turbinia was actually present on her very, on, at her launch um, to sail, to, well, to steam alongside her. That's lovely. Really, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting one. She was the very largest application of of this technology at that point. And her engines were only part of this, such an important story. And, and I, if you look at the plans of Mauritania, you realise how much is involved in one of these ships, how, how, how multi-layered they are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really, really fascinating. Um, Rudyard Kipling um, wrote about Mauritania. He actually penned a, a poem called Secret of the Machines uh, and referred to her as the nine-decked uh, monster city, uh, which was, yeah, they huge, huge ships. Um, you know, we have a, a particularly interesting um, set of plans, you know, lots of very, very long plans which give full details of all the decks. Um, you know, everything you know, all to the arrangement of where the piano is in the, in the first class saloon, to where all of the stools are in the bar and all of this sort of stuff. Um, you know, but we, we've also got this amazing sort of general arrangement plan which has an overview of all of these decks, um, one over the top and then the profile right at the very top. 
um, you know, showing her in steam. Uh, and it's, um, yeah, she's an absolutely monstrous, monstrous ship. Um, you know, it would have been quite amazing to have seen. And about 50,000 people came out to see Mauritania because it was, as, 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 as much as they were trying to keep her a secret, it's very difficult to keep a ship like Mauritania secret forever. Yeah, especially when you can say this is the, the largest ship <laughs> any of you will have ever seen before. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it, it's, yeah, she was definitely, definitely a, a technical and engineering first. And if also, if you assume it's a, it's a period before Instagram, right? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. now you'd be able to kind of go and have a look around mm. without actually going on board. But it must have been such a treasure for those few who were allowed on in those early years. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, by, by even by the very end of, of her life, um, you know, she was she was captain for most of her life by um, Captain Rostron. And she, she gained the nickname the Rostron Express. Um, you know, Rostron obviously more famous for, um, uh, you know, sort of gained uh, international fame as a result of being the captain of the Carpathia, um, the ship that had uh, come to the rescue of all of the Titanic survivors. Um, and then, so he was, he was the captain from uh, about 1915 to 1916. And then again, I think from about 1919 till 1928. Um, Interesting bloke. We should, very, we should get him on the podcast. Yes, and we, and we have those records in the archive as well for the Carpathia. So yeah, we're, yeah, we're very lucky. Well, we might come back and do the Carpathia at some point. He's, <laughs> he sounds fascinating. But, uh, yeah. um, and I love the little booklet showing the um, all, all of the kind of the technical aspects of the of the Mauritania. Tell me about that. Yes, that's um, yeah, that's that's. I think it's possibly one of my favourite items for Mauritania. Um, so it's a 14 page booklet and it's a celebration, I suppose, of, of her electrical equipment and the machinery on board specifically. Um, and it goes into a great deal of detail about things like the switchboards, um, you know, the distribution boards, the telephone exchanges. They all look like um, they've been invented by a mad scientist. They do. Now, they're I wonder fantastic. If they, I wonder if that's what they look like at the time. Everyone's <laughs> like, well, that's crazy. That's clearly not going to work or whether it was kind well, of normal. It's, I mean, they make a very big deal out of the fact that they use something called a, mag a magneto system, um, which operates with a, ma a master clock. And there were about 48 clocks all throughout the ship, um, all, all being, you know, all, all, all at the same time. Uh, and, and all to the same the same precision, um, you know. And that 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 seems to have been something that they were very proud wow. of. That's impressive, um, isn't it? Also, things like an you know electrically powered dishwasher. They've got a very a very great picture of uh, the electrically powered dishwasher, which was you know really like state of the art stuff. Is that um, the people in charge of building the ship? They were knew they were innovating with the overall construction, but they weren't going to let it stop there. Everyone was told to innovate, innovate, innovate. Everything's got to be new and yeah. crazy. Absolutely, absolutely. I think you know. I mean, you know, the, all of the the first class spaces they they were so incredibly opulent, and they were you know really you know by by today's standards it's unthinkable. But they were using they they had strict instructions. The designer um, uh, Harold Pito uh, he came up with uh, a design that all of Mauritania's interiors needed to be uh, to Francis the first style, which is from about the fifteenth to the seventeenth centuries. So. You know, it, this is this technical innovation, um, you know, this huge, huge technical innovation that people would have boarded on, but then they would have sat, found themselves sitting in something that looks like Hampton Court Palace or looks like, uh, you know... Versailles. Of, yeah, yeah, Versailles, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Interesting awareness of history. I wonder why they chose that. Who knows? Very strange. Yeah, it might yeah. have been a personal choice, or maybe that was their perception of what the ultimate luxury would be. Yeah, quite possibly, quite possibly. Mm. Um, and there's, you also showed me the wonderful drawing, so simple, of the design of the hull of Mauritania, showing how, how she sits uh, on the crest of a wave. I love that. It looked, I don't know, maybe kind of 40 years ahead of her time. I know what you mean, yeah. It's a sort of like a kind of a line drawing, I suppose, of Mauritania's kind of shape with this sort of inky watercolour blue wave. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of It's like it's been done by it. a Swedish architect in the <laughs> 70s. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And it's, um, yeah, it's a, really, it's a really interesting one. They were, they were really worried um, that with this technology and with a ship of her size that there would be an issue with how she would sit and ride the waves, um, uh, you know, as she was crossing the Atlantic. And so, um, you know, interestingly, you know, people, you know, this machinery never having been used on this in this scale uh, before, um, people throughout her life always complained about things like the vibrations of her engines and things like that, uh, which was something that plagued her throughout her life. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, but despite that, you know, even with things like the Olympic class liners, um, you know, which used a very different a reciprocating engine, um, which, you know, allow, you know, they, they, Mauritania still retains all of these records. Uh, despite not you know having been surpassed in size and uh, yeah, another forms of technology, she keeps that speed record for like twenty yeah, years. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, yeah, for twenty years until and uh, 
you know, they were so desperate to hold on to it that by by about uh, 1929, when uh, a ship, uh, another Norddeutsche Lloyd Line ship uh, called the Bremen breaks the record, um, actually really only by a fraction, only by a, re a real fraction, um, Mauritania's captain asks permission for the Mauritania line to do, for her to go into dock, uh, have her machines and engineering, uh, her machinery and her engines and boilers recalibrated, and then to have another crack at uh, regaining this, this, oh. this record, uh, which unfortunately she fails. She breaks, she breaks her previous, all of her previous records on this time, um, but sadly, she, um, yeah, she, she falls short by really a fraction. Do you think that's about having a place in history, wanting to, to, to break that record? Or is it, is it more simply about people will want to come on board us if we're the fastest? I don't know. I think it's... Is it hard-nosed commercialism <laughs> or, or, you know... I, th I think that there's definitely, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely a prestige element, I think. Um, you know, the Cunard line, um, you know, they, they, they're able to put it on all of their, their posters that they have, the, you know, the, the blue ribbon holder, the fastest, one of the fastest liners in the world. Um, you know, and, and that, that's an interesting uh, selling point, I suppose, for Cunard. Um, but also you've got the masters themselves and the crew. They take a great deal of pride in being um, a part of creating that record, I suppose, as well. So you do find that the, the ship's masters are also quite instrumental in, in really pushing to, to, you know, to try and regain these records or for go to go for these records because it is just a matter of, of, uh, of a great source of pride. And finally, let's just talk about safety at sea. I mean, do we, looking back on Mauritania now, is she seen as being a good design, a safe design? I'm just thinking about obviously what happened to Titanic no, mm. not, not long mm. afterwards. Yeah, she's. Um, I mean, I think. I think obviously, Titanic changed changed shipping safety. Um, you know, af afterwards. Um, you know, when, when she sank, uh, Mauritania was actually in uh, Queenstown, uh, modern day um, Cove in uh, the Republic of Ireland, um, and she was going to be carrying some of her mail as well for Titanic when they heard the news that she had been lost. Um, but I think you know, after, after in, with the with with the border trade inquiry um, that occurred after the loss. Um, you know, I think it, it's fair to say that I think that the issue, a lot of people always made a very big, big issue of the, the number of lifeboats. This was, I think, sadly, uh, something that was that was industry wide as a problem. And immediately after that happened, um, you know, both the Lusitania and the Mauritania were fitted with um, even more like clinker built lifeboats. Yeah, proper lifeboats. Um, you know, and in 1912 as well, they uh, it's decided that actually they need wireless technology. Uh, on all of their ships, yeah. uh, you know, in the event that anything like this ever happens again. So in some respects, she's a ship that's way ahead of her time with all of these new inventions. In other respects, the Mauritania is one. It's very much of her time with too few lifeboats and quite rattly. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition. And you know, um, you know that that particular booklet that we you know that we referred to earlier, which goes into all of the electrical installation on board Mauritania. Um, you know, they're, they're very proud of some of the safety safety mechanisms, even with regards to all of the electrical equipment, you know, the fail safes and the fuse boxes and things like that. Um, you know, but they've also got things like electrically powered boat winches and things like that for lowering the lifeboats down. And um, all of these things were, you know, obviously state of the art, but were intended to try and, you know, with the best will in the world to, to, to make things safer, um, ultimately. But uh, yeah, I think there were still fundamental things that needed to be done anyway, regardless, across the industry. Yeah. Well, fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for talking to me, Max. No, my pleasure.